is a considerable honor and certainly great pleasure to have with us today Dr. Antara Haldar. Antara is a university lecturer at the University of Cambridge, holding the inaugural position in empirical legal theory, and currently also a fellow at the universities of Stanford and Harvard in the United States. She's working on uh, many things, but what is most interest for us, interesting for us is her current work on post-capitalism. So, Antara, welcome and thank you very, very much for responding to this invitation. It's such a pleasure to be here, Sotaris. Um, thank you for having me. And also thank you for participating in the advisory board of the Center for Post-Capitalist Civilization. This is uh, also a great honor and joy for us. Allow me to start with uh, both a statement, as it were, and a question, a statement on post-capitalism post and a question to you on uh, how you see things. We live, as it were, in politically eschatological times. We know that an era is coming to a close, or rather that it has already come to a close. We do not know what will follow, yet we desire to know how to play a part in shaping it, in turning it towards a path of human dignity. We could easily say that the contradictory in term is encapsulated in the global permanent crisis forms the least of symptoms, particularly during this current COVID era. The primacy of bankrupt entities, bankruptocracy, as Varoufakis has named this, the limits of financialization, the emergence of wholly new types of automation, the development of artificial intelligence, the radical digi digitization of everything, all these merely indicative facts circumscribe a system that cannot be properly called capitalist anymore. It's not capitalism. We already witnessed the first stages of an emerging era that can only be described now uh, by that which it succeeds. We live in post-capitalist times. This may eventually prove to be utopian or dystopian or anything in between. Given that you do acknowledge such an end of an era in your work, how would you describe this era? What is happening before our very eyes, yet beyond the daily news cycle? That's a really great question, Sidaris. Um, Yeah, quite, quite the note to start the conversation on. Um, yeah, uh, you know, endings, as you referred to, um, are very much a theme of, of the current moment. Um, whether that is the ending of uh, a number of individual lives, um, I think we're, we're rounding in on a figure of 2.5 million COVID deaths globally, um, or whether we're talking about um, the end of an era. But you know, as we talk about endings, I think it's also important to think about beginnings. Um, and in particular, I always find it really important to focus in on the fact and draw attention to the fact that the era of capitalism that we consider to be the only possible way of organizing um, our individual and sort of global societies has only been around for about 200, 250 years. Um, so, so as you say, there have in the last little bit been these tectonic shifts, these seismic shifts, um, the, the compounding of globalization with the abstraction of financialization, and now with this explosion of technologization. Um, it, it may well be that the, the era that started with the steam engine uh, is ended uh, by the microprocessor um, and the internet. Um, but for me, more than whether it's the transition from capitalism to post-capitalism per se, um, I see this moment, my description of this moment, my definition of this moment is that of the exhaustion or at least the fragmentation of this one unifying logic that has been foisted on over 7 billion people for over 70 years now this one unifying logic that 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 you know the that modern you know global governance attempted to shoehorn the entire world into whether we refer to it as the washington consensus account of capitalism or you know whatever whatever the nomenclature happens to be 
Um, and I think the onslaught of crises that we're seeing are just demonstrating that that idea is deeply false. Um, I'll give you a few sp specific examples here. The notion that the market has this obvious primacy over the state or community, the idea that this miraculous invisible hand will come and allocate things in the most efficient way without requiring human parties, you know, you know, goodness or even human participation, really. The idea that the, the quantum of global inequality that we've got used to, whether it's within nations or between nations, is just part of the growing pains en route, um, you know, to this steady state end point that is that was posited as the capitalist equilibrium um, is starting to be challenged. Um, the fact that these challenges, I mean, despite the, the pain that we're going through now, in this era of relentless crises, I think the challenge to this idea is a very, very, very positive thing. Now, whether we transition to a state that is utopian or dystopian will depend on whether we're able to find an alternative model. Yes, and precisely due to the transitions that you mentioned, the belief of certain people, you know, that capitalism is the credo that will never die, acquires very religious elements right now. It turns into a religion and a scatology of capitalism. In any case, I understand that you are currently working on a book manuscript on the institutional foundations of an altered paradigm of capitalism, as well as on the future of the history of capitalism, which also acts as the title of this discussion and a title of some of your talks in the near past. Could you introduce our audience to this area of inquiry? What do you mean by the future of the history of capitalism? Um, again, really great question, Sotaris. Uh, thanks so much. Yes, I am uh, working on a book manuscript, uh, toiling away as a matter of fact, um, and I'm very sort of excited to, to talk about it. But let me talk to the future of the history of capitalism piece of, uh, of the question first. Um, so the world that I was born into, um, it wasn't quite in the 40s, but um, the, you know, the, the era that I grew up in was defined very much, it felt very much like an end of history moment. Um, in fact, Francis Fukuyama explicitly called it uh, the end, Fukuyama is interestingly based at Stanford, where, as you mentioned, um, uh, I'm currently based. Um, he explicitly described it as, as the end of history. So there was this real sense that the big problems, that the, with the end of the two world wars, the big problems of humankind had more or less been solved. Um, economics had figured out the formula to eternal prosperity, and the only problem that really remained was exporting that prosperity to the poorer nations. Um, what gave me the idea for this title um, was actually hearing endless of my colleagues in, in economics debate the historical origins of capital. Um, what role did the state play? Was it uh, an emancipatory process or, or uh, um, an extractive process? But instead of relegating to the, this to the realm of the hypothetical, it seemed to me that there were very obvious instances where we could test this, that there was a kind of living, breathing petri dish in the form of dozens of newly independent nations um, in, in the sort of post-colonial moment that were at exactly that stage of institution building that my, that my colleagues were speculating about. So we could actually, I mean, the entrails of these systems were kind of hanging out. We could see through the scaffolding into capitalism in construction. Um, and so, so it's, it seemed to me that by looking at the past of the developing of the developed world uh, and the present of the developing world, we could get really, really interesting cues into uh, the future of our of our world as a as a global society. So, so that's where the sort of future of the history of capitalism um, element comes from. This is one of the big dimensions of the book, but the main argument of the book um, is that. Um, Greece invented storytelling in many ways, um, and um, the, the argument of the book is that we've got the protagonist of capitalism wrong, but if we change that protagonist, we can actually get to a very different plot. And we now go to the protagonist of the capitalist plot, as it were, 
because you know people think that economics is all about economics, but it seems that anthropology plays an immense role in that. A key concept in all this seems to be the homo economicus, the anthropology of dominant economics. As you have aptly put it, and I quote, he, and usually he's a he, by the way, is infinitely rational, possessing both unlimited cognitive capacity and access to information, but with a persona of the Marlboro man, rugidly self-centered, relentlessly materialistic, and a complete lone ranger, end of quote. Yet you also point out that we now know that this is not how human persons actually behave and are. So if we are not homines economici, what are we according to the insights of behavior, behavioral economics? And please do explain to our audience what behavioral economics is as well. And how does the persistence of this old doctrine of the homo economicus influence our world today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we're not, we, uh, economics for the last 100, 150 years has depicted us as this kind of immoral version of this lone ranger cowboy uh, and has operated on the assumption that we are both completely atomized um, and completely rational read selfish, that the only thing that motivates us is our material self-interest. Um, we, we know this from our experiential accounts of our own lives, but now the cognitive sciences and, and the psychological sciences very firmly confirm uh, that we are, that th this is not anything like an accurate portrayal of who we are. And we depart from this portrayal in two key ways. The first is that we're emotional, um, what, it, what psychologists refer to as the affective or, or emotional parts of ourselves are baked into us as much as the cognitive, rational, um, you know, part, parts of ourselves. And the second thing is that, and, and we're realizing this during the, the lockdowns of the pandemic, we're intensely social beings. Um, so the, the combination of, of emotion and, and our, our tendency to, to be social um, has profound results for and, and consequences for how we should structure our societies. Um, I, you know, most of us are neither saints, nor are most of us irredeemably evil. Uh, most of us, in fact, are shapeshifters. We go to the theater and we look around the room and if a large majority of people are clapping or about to stand up to give the performance a standing ovation, we too are persuaded uh, to stand up. Um, so all of these character traits actually have really important evolutionary origins. Um, for us to survive as a species, we, we needed to mimic each other. We needed to, to learn to you know, read each other's sort of emotional cues and act in, in ways that gave us strength as a group. We were able to, in fact, outwit um, incredible forces against, uh, against our species um, by dint of, of clustering together. Um, Economics completely ignores this. Um, the behavioral revolution was the incorporation of some insights from psychology into economics. Um, psychology is a rich and flourishing field despite certain sort of methodological crises that it, it's currently um, in the throes of. But what economics internalized from psychology is that we are irrational more than we think we, we are, but not that we also have this intrinsic goodness, that there are you know, elements of us that, that gravitate towards the altruistic. By the way, we're not even the only species capable of altruism. Uh, rodents, monkeys, there's a, there's a long evolutionary trajectory um, of, uh, you know, of, of mammalian uh, altruism, uh, of, of which, I mean, of, of which we are the, the apotheosis, as it were. Um, the problem with the homo economicus trope is that precisely because we are social and precisely because economics has acquired this kind of primacy in our societies, homo economicus has become a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Although that is not our intrinsic nature, because 
we're being told that being a completely immoral businessman um, is how you get to the pinnacle of the, of, of, of the economic system. Um, we're going against our grain in many ways uh, to, to imitate, you know, it, it's a kind of, it's a very, very perverse instance of life imitating art um, with, with very radically awful results for society. Um, so what my book, I mean, what the main co contribution of my book is going to be to replace this protagonist with a much more realistic and relatable uh, protagonist. And, and I, I wish I could say more at this juncture, but perhaps closer to the time. No spoiler alerts, please. We have to read the book. So, uh, yes, I propose uh, dominant theories and alternatives to them based on research that we currently have. I propose orthodoxies and heterodoxies. In discussing the limits of the dominant theories and the alternatives to them, I cannot but think that the usual narrative goes like this. The dominant theories, the theories in use, and there's a reason they are in use according to the narrative, represent what we know, what is scientific, how the world demonstrably works. While alternatives to them are either speculative, deontological, or wishful thinking. This is a critique often leveled against the left, particularly concerning economics. This, um, yet our discussion points out the opposite, that it is the dominant theories that prove not to be grounded in actual reality as we know it to be now after research. Hence, for example, the inability to prepare for the 2008 crisis and its aftermath. But in their own rather dark wishful thinking, for example, as you mentioned, the performative shaping of the homo economicus by teaching that this is how human beings are. Now, what are your thoughts on this disparity between theory, that is the theory that is currently put into practice globally and taught in most departments, and reality, the way that we witness the world actually operating? And why is the alternative more realistic than our current orthodoxy? Great, great question. Um... So, you know, Sotoris, aesthetically, I feel like I'm a theorist. Uh, nothing is quite as satisfying as a, as a nice, neat theory with sweeping explanatory power. But politically, I'm an empiricist through and through. Um, and I really think that, um, that empiricism is, is our asset in our building or in our attempt to build uh, alternative paradigms. So when one constructs a theory, uh, no theory um, can accommodate the entirety of the empirical data that it seeks to explain, right? Um, so you, you take a large amount of data and you decide which ones you want to foreground and you just decide what, what you want to put in the background. Because theory is owned by those in power, uh, because theory is owned by the colonizers rather than the colonized. Theory is owned, has been owned by men rather than women. Um, this has hugely incentivized uh, or, or played a role in which parts of the empirical pool get foregrounded and which ones get neglected. So in a sense, we've ended up by theory um, by the 1% uh, and for the 1%, but off the hundred percent. I mean, they claim to speak for, for the hundred percent. Um, so I'm, you know, uh, I'm going to try. I'm, I'm trying to make our chat as jargon-free as possible. But if I may sort of indulge one little, you know, one sort of philosophical eccentricity of mine, um, my favorite word as a philosopher is epistemology. Epistemology is, is the study of, of knowledge and what goes into constituting knowledge. And, and this sounds like a word of the ivory tower, something that should not concern everyday people, but I, I don't think any opinion could be more wrong. Uh, those who control the ideas control the world. And so storming the epistemic citadel, ending the regime of epistemic apartheid, where only certain regions of the world get to make the theory, get to devise the ideas and then foist it on the rest of the world, um, is, is a matter of urgent importance, not only in the academy, but even politically. So just to give you an example, I mean, 
most of the developing world phil philosophical traditions outside of, of the West and such like have barely made it into the universal canon of, of scholarship that we have. Um, We've had theories about women for, for hundreds of years, that women were too emotional or too weak to be able to, to, to vote or own property, um, or even be students, leave alone fellows of, of the institution that we have in common, Peterhouse. It was very, very, very recently that, that women were allowed into roles like this. Um, and the COVID crisis and the incredible, rather inexplicable disparity between female-led nations and how much better they done uh, just just violently disproves these theories um, so yes I mean theory is is highly political and and epistemic justice uh, and is as important you know fighting to get our voices into the ivory tower is just as important as marching against austerity or joining the BLM march or joining the women's march um, it, it's it's deeply political and critically important Thank you very much. Uh, there's also, of course, uh, other considerations that the West completely forgets. For example, once upon a time, Europe had one quarter of the world population. Soon, very soon, it will have 4% or something like that. But Europe still acts and thinks as if she were the world dominator by uh, uh, colonialism, but also an important quantity as far as population is concerned. <laughs> Whereas uh, Europe in the very near future will be population province. Sorry for that. So uh, now returning to your texts, you have written somewhere that, and I quote again, economics, to return to economics, is even more ill-equipped to deal with looming seismic shifts on the horizon. By the way, this horizon takes on a new meaning now with the pandemic and its expected aftermath, <laughs> close the parenthesis, such as the accelerating effects of climate change, or how advances in uh, artificial intelligence will affect workers. Given the greatly amplified role of professional economists at every level of policy making, the extent to which economics is disconnected from reality is becoming uh, even more alarming, end of quote. Here I would add that economists take on the role that uh, high priests would take uh, in other eras. Now the question is, how do you imagine this changing? In which way could this change? In which direction? Well, one can dream, can't one? Uh, <laughs> no, but but I'm I'm fairly devoted to not leaving this uh, this this epistemic revolution, this revolution uh, in economics uh, to the realm of dreams. Um, and I have a sort of two point agenda for that, or or a two point strategy for that. The first is something that we already touched on uh, in the context of your previous uh, really excellent question, uh, and that is bringing wider empirical diversity into economics. Um, one of my, you know, one of my great intellectual heroes in economics uh, was Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, who, as it happens, was also the first woman ever to win a Nobel Prize uh, in, in economics. Um, story for another day. Um, but what she did is that despite the fact that economics had for decades argued that only the market or the state can solve coordination problems and not communities, she created a database of hundreds of thousands of instances from around the world of communities solving problems that economics had said that, that were impossible. Um, and, and in doing so, really made a dent in the consensus and opened up a huge, really fertile field um, of research and, and investigation. Um, in my own research, so a lot of my early research was on uh, the microfinance experiment, also a Nobel Peace Prize winning uh, intervention. Um, and what I was looking at there is that economists, again, for, for decades, uh, had not been able to solve the problem of rural credit. Um, it was just too expensive for the big banks to go into the villages of Bangladesh or Ecuador or regions like that um, and, and give out loans. Uh, microfinance completely, uh, uh, you know, an American educated Bangladeshi professor went back to Dhaka and on the basis of his local knowledge of the region and the people there and what makes them tick, uh, 
was able to solve a problem that theoretical economics had completely and for close to a century failed to solve. Um, and he did this by giving women of all people these small loans without any credit co co contracts, without any collateral, and achieved higher repayment rates than most of the big banks around the world. The point here is that if we open our eyes to it, if we make our models open to the influence of the variety of institutional model, you know, examples that we have at our disposal, we can really come up with a much wider range of, of viable institutional alternatives. Um, the second in my in my two point strategy uh, is epistemic humility or humility in general on the part of economics. Um, we owe economics a debt of gratitude in bringing a degree of quantitative rigor to the social sciences that was absent. But economics needs to be clear about what it can and it cannot do. Economics can help us quantify the trade-offs between pollutants in the air and industry that will augment growth numbers. But economics cannot tell us what our value systems are and which of those which of those two choices um, we should pick. Um, so I think building things like philosophy and the humanities back into the discourse, um, giving them more policy prevalence um, is, is really, really important. And I think between these two things, um, you know, the, the chance for, for the revolution in, in economics is um, is a real one. Interestingly, most of the biggest breakthroughs in economics in recent times, most of the things that have won the big prizes that have captured our imaginations that have led to New York Times bestsellers um, have been borrowed from other fields. Thank you very much. It's also very refreshing to hear from an economist a call to uh, bring back to life the humanities and particularly philosophy and its uh, deep wells like epistemology, etc. Uh, in the academy, although, of course, we now come to fully understand that the certainty that, the certainty that was longed after epistemologically in other eras is not there to be found. There is this uh, book by uh, Robert Passnow, After Certainty, a, certainty, a recent one, which uh, illumines that quite clearly. So, let me continue. Uh, if I may add just one quick point, Sotaris. Um, yeah. You know, interestingly, with economics, economics with the humanities disciplines and philosophy posits itself as a science and is quite bullying towards uh, certainly its neighboring social sciences and the humanities disciplines. But at the same time, it will not take seriously the lessons coming out of the cognitive sciences and neuroscience on what we know about human nature. So it hasn't, you know, so it's it's very strategically scientific uh, at, at times. So it, it uses its methodology to bully the more qualitative uh, disciplines, but doesn't really show the same fidelity to, to updating its own systems uh, in the light of, uh, you know, in, in the light of evidence coming out of the, of the pure sciences. Um, and th that would be a radical shift. All this while we've been told that our capitalist systems are as extractive as they are because we are short-sighted and self-interested. Uh, this turns out not to be the case. The, the fact that our systems have been designed the way they are has made us more short-sighted and self-interested. Uh, so the causality runs in the other direction. Yes, if I'm allowed a short comment on that, it, it seems like you portrayed that it's precisely uh, economics, the, the, the use by economists of uh, science that economics is a science as uh, structuring their role as a priesthood, a sacerdotium, which brings forth the truth to be uh, obeyed and realized. And uh, it's precisely this invocation of science that in a post-enlightenment uh, context can have this power, can exert this power, that now, you know, it's not the law of the strong, it's not a theory, it's not something that we, that we want, it's science. This is that dictates that uh, hominis economici populate the earth, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry for referring away, I'm returning to, <laughs> to the matter at hand. Now returning to the rule of law and its uh, challenges and questions. You have noted elsewhere the difficulties of trying to establish rule of law regimes 
in post-colonial countries or transition economies. Economies, with a joke here, of course, being on the rule of law regimes rather than the, on the post-colonial countries and transition economies. While you have noted that, that it currently seems to me that the rule of law is being increasingly tested in quite a few of the Western countries as well, as the acronym has it, the Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic countries, weird countries. How do you see the future of the rule of law in those countries as well? weird ones. Um, so my point about the rule of law has always been that we see the formal part of the structure. You know, we, we see the cogs in the wheel of the judicial machinery, but lubricating those wheels, making them turn is, are these informal elements, are, is, is trust, is commitment to be you know to cultural participation is faith and belief in the participants of the practice uh, in in what we're doing um for a long time the rule of law discourse posited you know drew a bright line between the developed world and the developing world much as europe in many ways drew a line between certain parts of europe uh, and the pigs nations um uh, you know attributing attributing to the, you know, kind of making the argument that, you know, this was a kind of God-given property that certain regions of the world had. And if the others could only catch up, uh, you know, their economic and other woes would disappear. Um, this, I mean, this is, is entirely and blatantly untrue, as we're seeing as these problems come home to roost in parts of the advanced industrial West and, and, and all around the world, really. Um, the analogy here is, you know, you fall in love, you go to a courthouse, I'm, I'm not endorsing heteronormativity here, I'm, I'm, I'm just pushing and using it as an analogy. You fall in love, you go to the courthouse, you get a sheet of paper that tells you you're now married. The job is not done at that point. Uh, the, the, the documentation is merely documenting a sentiment, a feeling, a relationship, an interaction. Just because you get the document does not mean that you can stop trying. The law is exactly like that. It is the culmination of a social process that allows us to do lots of really cool things like ban smoking and give women maternity leave and get people to wear masks. But for it to work, you have to have the continued engagement of the participants in that legal system. There's simply no way out of that. Um, I think the fact that the Western world took this lesson for granted, um, in the US we've had four years of extreme turbulence uh, on, on the rule of law front. Um, uh, I, I think that there's been a big price to pay for the fact that, that this was taken for granted. And again, going back to a previous point, if the epistemic lessons from other regions of the world had been taken more seriously, um, I think the entire world would have been better tipped off on how to deal with various kinds of contagion, whether that's viruses or, or despots. Um, it's not just an empirical point. We get better theory from dealing with a wider range of, uh, of, of empirical instances, whether in the domain of economics or whether in the domain of law. If I'm allowed a very short comment on that, it seems that we are trapped precisely in the epistemological assumptions of modernity as in Western modernity, because this idea, for example, that a perfect rule or a perfect institution, a structure, can solve all the problems. And if it doesn't solve the problems, then it's because it hasn't been followed thoroughly and according to theory. But, you know, you see this crumbling in front of our very eyes in reality, yet the, the, the doctrine will not go away because it's so deeply entrenched in the very foundations of Western modernity. Sorry for <laughs> the short comment. Now, continuing on the same vein and on the alternatives to uh, the problem you mentioned, you have underscored the need for the West to fetishize formal institutions less and promote civic friendship more. And you have said we should place less emphasis on the purely procedural and more on people and forge a sense of community in order for institutions or even states, large scale government, government structures to function properly. Otherwise, we're making them too rigid to survive, as per your phrase. 
Yet, how is this sense of community to be engendered in the case of abstract or imagined communities, rather than small communities of immediate neighbors that actually know one another? You mentioned elsewhere that religion has succeeded, succeeded in that regard for centuries, and that the lesson is that even in secular contexts, the creation of a shared narrative is essential to help support institutions. However, now my comment, there is a widespread tendency in modernity and late modernity in particular to assume that because religion achieves something, the same effect can be artificially recreated in vitro and in a secular context. And now religion, a religion that is resurging globally during the last three, gate, three decades, for us, another uh, Peter House fellow back in the day, John Milbank observes, and I quote him now, a key factor here is globalization. As soon as you start to remove national frontiers or they get blurred, you realize that religions have always operated very well across national frontiers and suddenly religions become a great deal more visible. Now what I'm trying to say is that in order to overcome problems as precisely this impersonal character of greater communities or even states, uh, we use religion as an example and take for granted that this can be simply reproduced in a secular context. But is this indeed the case? And if this does not work, then what is this differentiating element that would allow us to forge such communities? Yeah, uh, that is a truly stellar question. Uh, in, in fact, it is, uh, it is the question. It, it's the biggest question uh, that we currently face, I think. Okay, so what does religion establish? Religion establishes, for my purposes, the following lesson. Um, there's been a big debate about whether we, we obviously in evolutionary terms had certain incentives to cooperate, particularly with members of, of our own tribe um, and, and, and such like. Um, the, the big question for social science in many ways has been, can we have a man-made version of that? Is there some kind of narrative? Is there some kind of institution that we can create that will allow us to transcend our traditional tetherings, uh, mostly of kinship, so, so family, um, and then to some extent village, region, you know, nation state? Um, can we create that across different types of axes that are not biologically and geographically predetermined? Emphatically, the lesson from religion is that we can indeed do that. Uh, and if we could have done it once in the context of religion, we can do it again. I, I, I truly believe this in, in secular contexts, not by taking every leaf out of the book of, of you know, pun intended, uh, um, of, of, uh, of the religious texts, but by learning from them what the institutional structures were that made them work. So one is a shared narrative. Um, every really major religious tradition has a book, has tells a story, and, and we are drawn together by, by mutually inhabiting that story. Another really important part of, of religion is ritual. Um, you know, there is the, the holy day of the week, there are certain annual rituals that, um, this is, I mean, at, at a biological level, this is how, bond formation happens. Um, you, you have to have the formal structures, but then you have to keep reiterating the narrative and having practices that kind of reinforce uh, the, the inhabiting of, of that story. Um, so I think that there are really important lessons that, that we can learn um, from religion as an institution rather than you know, religion per se, as a, as a kind of institutional case study almost. And I think the fact that liberalism has recoiled from religion to the extent that it has, has meant that we lost the opportunity to, to learn many of those lessons, you know, sort of, you know, slightly throwing the baby out with the bathwater. The more logistical answer to, to your question is, I think federalism is the key. Um, I envisage community as, as uh, as, as a nest of Russian dolls almost. So, so you have, uh, you know, you have one set of tetherings with, within a small group and then you locate that within a bigger group and, you know, and radiate all the way out to a global community. 
But the point is getting those bricks right, where you know, e now each of those rings has to have meaning for its participants, and we have to figure out where we make those bricks. Um, it was fascinating to me. So I, I referenced working on microfinance earlier. Um, there's an Oxford-based evolutionary biologist and social psychologist who I'm doing a little bit of work with, um, who works on primates. Uh, and he found that the groups that make sense cognitively and affectively for our great ape ancestors um, was 5, 15, 30, all the way up to 150, um, which completely by coincidence was exactly what the group sizes uh, were that the microfinance experiment arrived at. So there seems to be something built into our cognition that means that immediacy is, is important. Um, but we can mediate that by creating a, 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 a federalist structure and just being conscious of this, of this element um, of affect uh, that is necessary to, to, to sustain uh, these institutions. Um, you know, this is actually a good occasion for me to give a shout out to Yanis. Um, I, I really, really appreciate that despite finding himself on the Greek side of the Eurozone crisis, um, that he's never given up on the Euro itself as an experiment. He's always drawn attention to the fact that the problems are with this iteration of the Euro. We, w w of, of, of the EU rather, um, you know, and so we don't, the, the troubles that the EU are facing um, are not evidence of failed regionalism or internationalism. It just means that we have to go back to the drawing board to create, you know, to overcome the democratic deficit more, more effectively. Uh, but I really do think that by building affective allegiance into our thinking on institutions and being imaginative about how we structure federalism we can uh you know we we can achieve really great things um and those narratives i think can be based on on a whole range of different affiliations and things that we care about i personally am much more defined by my love for the films of federico fellini than i am by my uh, religion or nationality or even gender um you know in, in a deep sense and in the global cities around the world in new york and london and uh, and, and and berlin um in university campuses all around the world there are communities is being forged anew. Uh, as you know from having been at Cambridge, one is much more defined at Cambridge uh, by the college one happens to be at in many ways than which country one's come to Cambridge from. Um, so I remain optimistic uh, about our capacity to build institutions, um, but they have to be built to have meaning for their participants. Thank you very much. I apologize if uh, you lost me for two seconds or three seconds because you were mentioning religion and then the experiment at the other place on primates hmm. and my mind drifted to primates as in you know the Archbishop of Canterbury then I understood that the context was quite different and the staggering polysemy of the word primates hit me so returning to economics and to our immediate fate there's quite a discussion taking place concerning the economic repercussions of the pandemic and how there is an accelerationist perspective after the pandemic concerning post-capitalist transitions. It's also interesting to see how other countries, for example, in Asia, have, seem to have avoided those economic repercussions in a comparison to what we term you know, Western countries. Hmm. How do you expect these repercussions to unfold in the post-pandemic world? What would the expected magnitude be? And more importantly, to whose expense? Um. Yeah, again, really, really excellent question. Um, so I think what the pandemic has revealed, uh, the biggest lesson for me, is that economists in, economic, in, you know, in, in university departments or economists around the table in policy settings talk about the economy as though it's something that's separate from society. Um, I, but what we've seen in the context of the pandemic is that for the economy to function, it rests on a 
whole lot of pre-existing conditions. Um, it requires a modicum of, you know, it requires that the region be reasonably plague and war free. Um, it requires um, that, uh, you know, that there be a, a system of global governance, that there be an element of trust in law, that that healthcare systems work. So there's a, there's a whole lot of, of, of societal, community-based state-driven factors that the functioning of the economy is deeply, deeply, deeply embedded in. Um, and so I think the, the biggest takeaway from, uh, from the economic fallouts of the pandemic is that this is what we need to address. Uh, that we can't, you know, we've had economic globalization without having any kind of com comparable societal globalization. So, you know, it's, it's really hard to sort of um, cherry pick when you have such, you know, such, uh, uh, such fused fates. I mean, you, you can't just have, I mean, you can't have an economic globalization without structures that, that prop that up in, in, uh, in other domains. So again, a shout out to Yanis here. I mean, I think that's why his Progressive Alliance project is so critically important. In, in creating a kind of universalist base at a political and institutional and at a governance level uh, to match the incredible base of, of globalization um, that we've had. Uh, so I think that's lesson one, that the economy is embedded in society. The second lesson is that our fates are collective. Um, you know, nothing, uh, you know, I mean, we, we either come out of this global pandemic together or we, you know, we sink or swim together. And it's interesting to see that the nations that have a more collectivist culture have done a much better job of dealing with the fallouts of the pandemic uh, than, than the more rugged cowboy individualistic kind of societies. Yeah. So the hominess economic are more prone to the coronavirus as it seems due to the performed anthropology. So now uh, reaching gradually the end of our uh, very fulfilling discussion, from the future of the history of capitalism to the history of the future of capitalism, let us briefly imagine the best case scenario and the worst case scenario, the utopia and the dystopia in the, after the transitory, transitory period that we are currently living in. In the former case, how would an altered paradigm of capitalism look like, including the transition to it? And in the latter case, what gloomy fate and doom awaits us? Um, that, that is a big question. So bad news first or good news? Bad news, so that we will end on a positive note. I think so, I think so. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the, the, the worst case scenario, Sotoris, is, is, is very bad. We're acutely aware of this now. We've been living in 12 to 15 years of ongoing political, economic, social, natural crises uh, that are careening wildly out of control. Um, the biggest obstacle confronting us uh, is that of, of, of climate change. We've posited our economic theories and how we've designed our capitalist societies on the assumption of infinite resources. Uh, that assumption is simply not true. Um, if we carry on as we are, it is overwhelmingly likely that we will exhaust those planetary resources. There is some at the margins chances that that technology will will overtake, um, you know, the, the pace of technological change will overtake the, the uh, rate of depletion. I'm highly, highly skeptical about that because economics, I mean, ironically starts with scarcity. The, the reason one has economics is because there's scarcity, but it's it's not built into the macro level models. Um, so that, I mean, to use an economistic term, the planet is the binding constraint. Um, but the more and more these kinds of constraints push up against us, the more there are wildfires, fires and floods and mass migrations and, you know, ruling despots and so like and so on, the more we're likely to, to turn against each other. So we might even 
you know, our, our, our destruction of each other might uh, might be quicker than our destruction of the planet. Um, in either scenario, it, it's a race to the bottom. Another very not unlikely scenario is, is if we continue to incentivize and make all our decisions purely on an economistic basis, um, we may end up creating creatures, I mean, we, we may end up genuinely in a matrix-like scenario where we're as slaves as a species to a kind of AI cyborg, cyborg super race. Um, but the point here is that it's, it's our planet, our species, our civilization, our moment. Um, it would be idiotic to sit back and fiddle like uh, Nero while, while Rome burns. Um, the immediacy of the call to action could not be more urgent uh, and we need to respond to it now. Um, we can't waste this crisis. We, we simply can't afford to. Um, all of that said, I think that there is room for optimism. I, I, I think that there is actually, you know, a chance of, of, of turning this around. Um, and I think it's actually, you know, the, the basis for this already exists and the tweaks that we need to make um, at the academic level, at the intellectual level, at the policy level, but also in the minds of our 7.8 billion people. Are act I mean, they're fairly simple steps. I would want to see economics as a discipline and economies that recognize human nature for what it is for its goodness in addition to its selfishness, um, and that is committed explicitly to another concept that comes out of Greece, the Aristotelian notion of human flourishing. That really needs to, to, to be the end, of, you know, the, 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 all of the rest of what we do needs to be a means to that very end. Um, I would want us to recognize that what we have in common far outstrips the things that, that you know, drive us apart. So for all our talk of Palestine and Israel or, you know, the Kashmir conflict or the ongoing ways in which we find, you know, to, to make divisions between ourselves, we've been unified by this tiny little microscopic virus. Um, we're all vulnerable to it. it. It's taken something that we can't see with the naked eye to demonstrate that really it, it is a common fate that, that we share. Um, I would like to see a world in which all human beings, whether they're born in Germany or Greece, whether they're born in Sao Paulo or San Francisco, uh, to have a sense of entitlement to, to the resources of, of, of the planet and to have equal normative value that is not completely determined by an accident of birth. And I would like us to recognize that our greatest strength is our capacity to cooperate rather than just sort of compete and, and you know, uh, compete with each other and, and undermine each other. Um, I, and I really think that these, these shifts for which we have the, the scientific basis and the, and the philosophical rubrics, um, replacing homo economicus with a more sympathetic character which is what we are, can, can really, really, really change the arc of this plot uh, and deliver us uh, to a happy ending. So apart from all other things, we need a new anthropology, economic and economical and otherwise. Dear Antara, thank you very, very much for this brief but immensely satisfying discussion and enriching discussion. Thank you for your uh, wisdom and vision and for the time you have invested in this uh, discussion that will form part of uh, a number of talks at the Center for Post-Capitalist Civilization in which we try to explore this period of transition. Post-capitalism is not a vision of something positive. It's a diagnosis of a transition that is happening in front of our very eyes. So again, many, many thanks. I look forward to an immense degree to reading your uh, forthcoming book, hopefully the audience of this discussion as well, and many greetings to Stanford and indirectly Cambridge. Thank you so much, Sotoros. This has been a, a real delight. Um, it's been, uh, you know, it's been wonderful chatting with you as ever. Uh, thank you for the really, really insightful questions. Uh, and yeah, um, 
it's it's incredible to join forces with the center. The book addresses many of, of the, the central questions and, and concerns um, of, of the center. And I hope that, uh, um, you know, that, that together that, I mean, I hope that, that many of you will read the book and that together we can uh, make our way through this transition to the happier rather than the more tragic ending. Thank you.